lifting you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I've never been more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't slow down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind. So I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. Jaira, you are enough. Jaira, you are enough. And I will be content in every circumstance. Good morning, Pine Grove. Good to see you this morning. God is good and all the time. 
Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I tell you. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. But we have completed 21 days of fasting and prayer. Hallelujah. So I just, I tell you, I trust that the Lord has done something in your life. Uh, I pray that he will continue to do something in your life. Uh, it's, to me, it's a mystery. Uh, sometimes God does something while you're fasting and praying, and you know about it. Sometimes he does something during the fasting and praying, and you don't know about it. It, it may be down the road a little while before you realize, hey, God did something in me. But either way, if we give our hearts to know him, and to know his will, and to crucify our flesh, take up our cross and follow him, you will not be disappointed. God will help you along the way and bless you. And so thank you so much. Uh, I do, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, is there something else? No, I think that's about it. So we're going we're gonna to jump right in. I got a lot to say and a little time to say it. So uh, I'm going to preach fast. Y'all listen quick, okay? Uh, I want to talk to you uh, for a little while here this morning about after supper. After supper. We'll be going to John chapter 13, so if you want to turn in your Bibles or get it pulled up on your uh, device, that'll be great. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here, and you're, some of you may not understand it, uh, many of you may not understand it, but as we go, my hope and prayer, my mission is to help you to understand what I'm about to say. Uh, what we do before supper and during supper is crucial. For it determines what we'll do after supper. Our walk with Jesus is a progressive walk. We begin as babes desiring the pure milk of his word. But then, little by little, as we grow, we will encounter ministry opportunities. Opportunities to share our faith. Opportunities to witness to somebody. Opportunities to, to join in and do something. Our faith is tested. And our faith grows through these tests. Even in failure, listen to me, church, even in failure, we learn what to do and what not to do. And so the next time, we'll have better success. What we did yesterday prepared us for today. What we did yesterday and what we do today will prepare us for tomorrow. The lessons we learn will influence the people we meet. God wants to use us to carry out His plan for humanity the church is plan A. There is no plan B. The question is, are we paying attention? Are we learning the lessons of today and preparing for tomorrow? What we do before supper and during supper is crucial for it determines what we'll do after supper. So we're going to read John chapter 13. We'll read down. We're going to go ahead and read it. And then we'll talk about it. We'll come back and talk about it. Uh, but let's go ahead and read it and then we'll pray. John chapter 13, begin reading in verse number 1. John 13, verse number 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, there's our title, after supper. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he, would come, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel 
with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. And when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Let's pray. Your gracious Heavenly Father, sir, we do humble ourselves before your throne of grace here this morning. Lord, thank you for this message. It's a message that speaks to our hearts. Lord, as we have concluded 21 days of fasting and prayer, Lord, you have drawn us near near to your heart, nearer now, I pray, than we were before. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, as we conclude this fast, this word is what you have given us to feast upon. Lord, let us be partakers of your word and your will in our lives. God, hide us behind the cross of Jesus Christ here this morning. Let Christ be exalted in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen and amen. I want to talk to you this morning. I want to give you four points. Number one, know the time. Know the time. Jesus knew his hour had come. He says, now before the feast of the Passover, when, he, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, Church, children, it's important that we know the time, the time of our life. We may have a long life, we may have a short life, but I promise you this, everybody has one life to live. Just to clear up any confusion, you don't live this life and then come back as a butterfly or something, a bird or any any beautiful creature that you admire and want to come back as, as a kitty cat or a dog. No. When, when we finish this life, we're done. <laughs> Our race is, is finished, as the Apostle Paul said. So make sure you know what time it is. What do you mean, Brother Ricky? Jesus lived his entire life in ministry for what was about to take place. What he did before supper shaped what he would do during the supper. Jesus was about to depart and go back to the Father. How did he know? How did he know that he would return to the Father? How, do you, how did Jesus know that he was going back to the Father? Because his life centered around his father. His, his life centered around doing what God the Father wanted him to do. He had a mission when he came here. When he left heaven, you see, when he was born in that, in that stable in uh, Bethlehem, that, that was not the beginning of his existence. The Bible declares that he 
He has no beginning. He has no end. But when he left heaven and he came here, he came here on a mission. And he lived his entire life on mission. He knew his time. He came from the Father. He, well, before I say that, he proclaimed at the age of 12. Now we wonder how much a 12-year-old knows. He already knew what his purpose was. He told his earthly folks, he said, I must be about my father's business. He knew what he was here for, folks. Can I tell you something? The devil will lie to you. He will tell you you have no purpose, that God has no plan for you. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care where you've been, but if you've accepted Jesus Christ, I can tell you where you're going. Hallelujah. And God's got a plan. God's got a purpose for your life. He came from the Father, and he was returning to the Father, and everything in between focused on his Father. He never lost his focus. He never lost his focus. He kept his eyes on the goal. Deception, listen to me, church, Deception is not the only tool of the enemy. Distraction is just as deadly. If Satan can distract us from doing what God's called us to do, then it's going to be devastating to those around us. I'm telling you, do not underestimate the impact that God will use you in your life to make a difference in the lives of those around you. Distraction is deadly. We must stay focused. How do we stay focused? Well, we just finished 21 days of fasting and prayer. That, that's one way that we can stay focused. When we fast and pray, the goal is to give up something that our flesh desires to help us to focus on what God has for us. Instead of eating a meal, we open up the Word and we read His Word. Instead of, you know, scrolling, we, we, we get His Word out or, or we listen to a message or, or a teaching. We, we're fasting and we're doing away with the worldly stuff so that we can gain the spiritual. That's how we stay focused. And you don't have to wait until the first of the year to do it. Okay, amen? We, we fast throughout the year. Uh, I know people, some people have a certain day of the week that they fast. Some people have a, a certain day of the month that they fast. Listen, fast and pray. Jesus didn't say if you fast and if you pray. He said when you fast and when you pray. Fasting and praying helps us to stay focused. His Father sent Him, provided for Him, protected Him, empowered Him, taught Him, guided Him, and eventually would sacrifice Him. Why? That was part of his purpose that was part of the goal listen his father was not an addition to his life his father was his life church don't let don't let God be an addition to your life well I'll fit it in you know I'll fit him in when I i got a little block of time here. I'll, I'll fit in a little prayer. I'll fit in a little Bible reading. I'll fit in a little church time. No. 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 Jesus knew that His Father was His life. And He lived it to the full. You want to live life to the full? Let God be the nucleus of your life. Let God be the center of your life. And let your life revolve around Him. His life's desire was to live for His Father so that He could return to His Father. So we have to know the time. And the next thing we need to know is we need to know the mission. Jesus loved His own. He loved His own. Listen to me, church. They were not loved because they were good. They were not loved because they were good. They were not loved because they had it all together. They were loved because he was good. They were loved because he was good. You think about it. 
These people that is that at, is at this supper, these people that he's been leading, he's about to leave these people in charge. And according to Matthew, they had Jesus had told them, "Hey, I'm I'm fixing to be delivered to the you know the the elders, and they're going to kill me." And, and you know what these people did? These followers did? They're fussing and fighting about who's going to sit on his right and who's going to sit on his left. It's not that they had it all together. He loved them. And he had big plans for them. Even when they didn't have it all together. Don't wait until you get it all together, church. Don't wait for that perfect day because it ain't going to come. Don't wait for that perfect time because it ain't going to come. Don't wait until you break all your bad habits and, and get everything in order because it ain't going to happen. Jesus is using people. And he's not afraid to use imperfect people. Jesus took the people that the world had rejected and Jesus changed them and then used them to change the world. Think about that. He took imperfect people that society didn't want anything to do with. Fishermen, listen, that was not a high class job. I just thought I'd go ahead and tell you. I know some of us think it is today, but in their culture, it was not a well thought of profession. What Jesus did before the supper prepared a people for the supper. What Jesus did before the supper prepared a people for the supper. The life that he lived, the ministry that he had, all of that, listen, it wouldn't have been possible to have this supper in this manner had he not already lived it for well over 30 years. We have to know the challenges. Know the challenges. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you, church. There's going to be challenges when you live for Jesus. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Why did Jesus, who knows everything, he, he knows the end from the beginning, why did he even choose Jesus, Judas? Let's talk about it. Friends, I want to tell you something. Jesus did not open Judas' heart to the devil. Judas opened his own heart to the devil. Jesus didn't open his heart to the devil. Judas made that choice. You see, people want to blame anything and anybody for their own problems. And I'm not saying that people don't do us wrong. I, I think I can safely look over this congregation I think I can safely say every single one of us has been done wrong. We've been cheated. We've been lied to. We've been taken advantage of. We've been abused. You name it, we've experienced it. But can I tell you something? That is not an excuse to keep us from doing what God has called us to do. It is not an excuse. In the end, we're each responsible for our choices. God will not hold guiltless those who have committed wrongs against us, but we cannot allow them to dictate our response to their wrongdoings. I've shared my testimony many times. I'm not going to share it again. But I can tell you as a little boy growing up, in a broken home and 
mom and dad did not know Jesus and were not living for Jesus, man, you, you want to talk about having what seemed like good excuses to hate people and to want to take vengeance on people? I had the reason. But God convicted me, and I had to forgive them for the pain that they had caused me. I could not let that be an excuse to keep me from what God wanted me to do. He's not going to hold them guiltless. They have, to, they have to confess and repent, or they will pay the consequences. Jesus gave Judas every opportunity to have a good heart. He gave him every opportunity to have a good heart. Judas walked with Jesus during his ministry, but Judas chose to walk away from Jesus at the end of his ministry. Judas saw the miracles, heard the teachings, witnessed the power of God at work in the God-man, uh, but he chose to ignore all of it and make his own choices instead of allowing God to direct his steps. Judas chose to allow Satan into his heart. Friends, we have choices to make every day, and we need to pray and ask God what choices that we will make. I can tell you this, the older I get, the more I ask God for direction, even in the little things. I've, I've had issues on my bus, on my school bus, that, I mean, just dealing with students, dealing with kids, because I see that as a mission field. I don't see it as a job. <laughs> the, the insurance and the, the pay, that's a bonus. I see it as a mission field. So every action that I take on that bus is going to be affecting the lives of those young people. I have to ask God for direction. Father, how, how do I need to handle this? How, how am I going to show Jesus to them? How am I going to help them to make good choices in their life? Church, I pray. I'm telling you. that There's things that you think, well, you're just a knucklehead because you don't know how to handle that. You just need to do this and do that. Can I tell you something? 59 years of living, I've done that too many times. And you want to know how many messes I've made? A lot of them. There are two, well, listen, remember Jesus was all about the Father. Jesus was all, all about the Father. Judas was all about himself. Judas was all about himself. There are two clear choices. We can be like Judas who put himself before God. Or we can be like Jesus who put the Father before himself. Which one are we going to choose? Which one are we going to choose? Number four. We need to know the blessings. Know the blessings. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. And that he had come from God and was going to God. The Father had given all things into his hands. Jesus rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. Jesus, before the betrayal, before the betrayal, before the mob, before the crucifixion, had all power. He had all power and he had all authority. He could have said, nope, not going to do it. He had, he had the power. He had the authority. But what did he choose to do? He chose to do the Father's will. Look at John. Well, I, didn't, I didn't pull that one up. But John in John 10, I'll just tell you what it says. Uh, Jesus, here it is. 
Jesus says, therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? He's got the same power that in the beginning, when God spoke and all creation was made, Every star, every planet came from the vapor of his breath. You talk about power. He had that power right now at this supper time. He had that power given to him. Can you imagine having the same power that in the book of Genesis when he formed man, took some dust? How many of you... Have, Ever made mud pies? I did. He took, he took dust. He took a mud pie and formed it into a man. And with power, the breath of God came out of his lungs and entered that man, that, that clob of dirt, and he became a living being. Can you imagine? That's the power that he had. At this supper, when the mob came out after him, and he said, who are you looking for? As if he didn't know. He said, we're looking for Jesus. He spoke, I am he. And they stumbled and fell all over each other. The power that came out. That's the power he had at this supper. What did he do? What did he do with that power? What did Jesus do with this power and authority? He washed dirty feet. He washed dirty feet. He even washed the feet of Judas, his betrayer. Judas had already made a deal with the elders, the priest. He'd already made a deal. How much will you give me? How much will you give me? We'll give you 30 pieces of silver. That was the cost of a slave. Judas said, I'll take it. He'd already made up his mind. Jesus knew all this and still chose to wash that man's feet. Doing the right thing is the greatest form of love known to man. Doing the right thing is often the most difficult thing you'll ever do. Especially in the world that we're living in. Listen to me, church. Don't let this culture that we're living in tell you how to serve God. Do not. They, they don't have any authority over you. God has, if you're a child of God, God's got authority over you. You listen to him. You don't listen to them. What is the right thing, Brother Ricky? What is the right thing? How will I know? Ask him. Ask him. Cannot tell you how many times I've been in situations and circumstances where I didn't know. I didn't know what, was, what needed to happen. I didn't know what, the, because there was two things that look like, man, I, I do this and that seems right, but I do this and that, and both of them couldn't be right. So what did I do? I asked him, Lord, what do you, what do you want? What do you want us to do? And it might be one of those, or it might, he might bring something out of left field. And I'm like, oh, didn't think about that one. I've done that several times. Ask him. You'll know, he'll show you what the right thing to do is. What Jesus did before supper prepared him for what he would do after the supper. The life he lived for God his Father prepared him for the difficult task that would come his way. Friends, can I encourage you? Don't shun the difficult times. Don't push back from the difficulties that we face in life. 
Because what we're facing that is tough right now is preparing us for tomorrow. That, that difficult choice that we're having to make now, that difficult circumstance that we're facing right now, listen, God prepared you for that time. God prepared you. And so whatever it is that you're going through right now, listen, just, just hang on and, and continue to stay in His will, walk in His Spirit, do His will, and then afterwards, you're going to be prepared to face the next battle the next temptation, the next trial that comes your way. Peter, <laughs> remember Peter? The one that said, you're not going to wash my feet? Listen to what he says. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Peter, the one who didn't want to humble himself and let Jesus wash his feet is saying, hey guys, let me tell you something. I learned, and I learned the hard way. Humble yourself. God cares for you. God will take care of you. Put it all on him. Put it all on him. Paul says it this way. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. church we have to know the time we have to know the mission we have to know the challenges and we have to know the blessings Peter resisted having his feet washed because of pride Jesus rebuked Peter to help Peter defeat his pride Peter surrendered and Jesus declared him clean we can come to Jesus dirty and he'll clean us up and declare us clean. We cannot clean ourselves up, church. We cannot. Jesus set the example. He says, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Know the time. What you do before supper matters. Surrendering to Christ and following him now is crucial. Know the mission. What you do during supper, during supper matters. What did Jesus do? He prayed and he served. He prayed and he served. Number three, know the challenges. What you do after supper matters. Stay humble. Do the right thing, even if it's hard. Number four, know the blessings. Again, what you do after supper matters. Peter, again, as his divine power has, look what he's given us, look what God has given us. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus received great power, great authority, and we see what he did with it. Now he had... You, the supper that we're talking about is the Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper. As you have already figured out, we're doing uh, communion here this morning. But before we do communion, I just want us to, to take a moment and pray. Take some time and pray. I'm not going to read it, but the Bible says that we should not partake of communion if we got sin in our lives. And so God forbid that I don't give you an opportunity, don't give all of us an opportunity to say, hey, Lord, I'm sorry. And so this is, this is what we're going to do here this morning. Uh, let me see if I can get this thing to do that. There we go.
Oh. As we have opportunity to pray, I want you to do, I'm going to give you some instructions. Number one, come before him humbly. Come before him humbly. Cast all your cares upon him. Number two, everything you've got, every, every sin, every care, every anxiety, every tormenting thought, cast it upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And then number three, if we will do that, if we will do the first two, the Bible says if we come to him and humble ourselves before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I'm going to do this. We, we got time. Okay, we got time. I'm going to open the altars up. And if you want to come to the altar and pray, come and pray. If you want to make an altar where you're at in your seat, you can do that. But let's take a few minutes and let's pray and let's seek God before we take communion. Amen. Come on and let's pray, church. Thank you, church. Oh, thank you for taking this opportunity to unload on to God the things of life that we can't handle and I don't know of too many things that I can handle that's why I'm glad we got a great God amen let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise thank you Jesus we're about to partake of Holy Communion let me kind of help you to understand uh, you don't have to be a member of Pine Grove Church to partake. Uh, we do ask that you be a believer in Jesus Christ. You don't have to partake. When the plates come by you, you can partake of the bread and the cup, or you can pass it on down to your neighbor. Uh, help out your neighbor that is there in close proximity to you. If they need a little help you know, getting their bread and their cup, you help them out if you will. Uh, at that last supper that evening you go back and you read it Jesus he took the bread and he broke it and he said take this eat of it this is my body which is broken for you you see when Jesus went to the cross. Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That's why this is so important. He said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. In other words, I want to remind you how much I love you. I want to remind you I paid the price. I died in your place. That's what he's saying through this. He took the cup and he blessed it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take this and drink from it. This is the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant, the Old Testament. We were talking about it recently. Can you imagine in that old covenant, you find 613 commands. Not just the Ten Commandments, but 613 commands. Folks, I don't mind confessing. I struggle remembering 10. I cannot imagine having to remember 613 commands that under that Old Testament, under that old law, if you broke one, you broke them all. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he did. When John the Baptist saw him coming down that hillside to be baptized in the Jordan River, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What can wash us white as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So church, this morning, as we partake of communion, I want you to remember He nailed our sins to the cross, shed His blood for our cleansing, and then He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could live for Him. I want to ask our usher team, if they will, to come. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, You gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him, trust in Him, commit their lives to Him, would not perish in hell, but have everlasting life. Jesus, You said, no man takes my life. I give it. And Lord, we partake of Your communion here this morning symbolizing your body and your blood which was given for us. And Lord, we receive it with thanksgiving. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Today is a great day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let me pray for you. Gracious Heavenly Father, Sir, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for showing us how to live. God, as we go from this place, we do so in the power of your Holy Spirit and let us live to make a difference because you made a difference in us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. Go in peace. And then we'll get into our message and worship. Uh, Women of Worth tomorrow night uh, at 6 o'clock. Is that at the church? Okay, that's at the church. Fellowship Hall, yes. Do they need to bring food? No. They don't make, yeah, you right. They don't meet without food. All right, anyway, enough of that. Uh, first Wednesday night, coming this Wednesday night, uh, please register for that or come anyway. We will have Texas chili, uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, and salad and dessert so uh yeah come wednesday night good food uh good time of sharing uh next sunday morning will be our men's breakfast at 7 30. that'll be the eggs and the biscuits and the sausage and gravy and all that good stuff so men you need to come next sunday morning at uh 7 30. Uh, a couple of things coming up we've got a church work day february 18th uh so we really need as many of the men and the ladies to come. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of stuff going on the inside. I think the ladies are going to be heading that up. And men, we do need a lot of help for some projects around here. We're trying to get ready. Now, you wonder why we're having a work day on the 18th. Let me tell you why. Because the 19th, we're going to throw a big party to per celebrate the paying off of this mortgage. Let me give you something else, too, while I'm thinking about it. This coming Thursday night, if you are part of the first responders team, uh, now that's you, medical folks, security team, ushers, uh, leadership staff, uh, I will be getting you a notice, but 6 o'clock Thursday night, we will meet in the fellowship hall. This is a very important meeting. We don't have this, but generally about once a year, so please come Thursday night. I will reach out to you. And then one last announcement. They had a missions meeting here yesterday evening at 5 o'clock. 
one of the things that you don't see that happens a lot, uh, the church, the body of believers here, are always at work doing work here locally, helping folks, doing missions in Kentucky and everywhere else. And I know some of you asked yourself, well, why do we do missions in Kentucky? Let me tell you why. Because God gave us the opportunity to do it. And we don't need to be turning God down. So we're going to start talking a lot about missions the next few weeks. And if God leads your heart there, please donate and help with that because we're going to be doing several things. And I will tell you this, and I probably, it's a little bit of a tease. Uh, I'm going to be sucking up the next couple of weeks. And so you'll know what that means is God's given me the opportunity to go on a mission trip with my grandson to Mexico in May. So I'm really excited about that, and I want to share that with you. And just uh, anyway, God bless. Any other announcements or anything we need to do? Are y'all ready to worship? Are you ready to worship? Stand up. Come on, praise team. guess y'all gonna have to fire me or strike my legs one uh, i'm getting to where i'm having some sun timer moments so y'all <laughs> please forgive me for that it's good to see ted here this morning i don't know where if he moved with me or not but i praise god it's good to see ted here this morning i do want to share some love with you that uh, was given me this morning a card uh, from virginia and her family she says there are not enough words to fully express our heartfelt thanks for the outpour of prayers, love, support, and sympathy you have extended to our family during this difficult time. Woo. Dennis was more than a husband, a father, and a friend. He was one that would go through the fire, take a bullet, or step in front of a train to protect his circle of family and friends. If you were in his circle, he loved you that much. Dennis was my soulmate, best friend, my everything. He was a loving but stern father and grandfather. A call away to help, give advice, or a big hug. He was a great friend. He would help anyone with anything if he could, and he could do just about anything. Losing him is so painful, but it is a great gain for heaven. He made the comment that God must have a big project for him to do in heaven. He was so happy to be a part of this church. It was home. He would have loved the service and all the red. And just know he loved you all. Thank you again, Virginia and family. Amen. First he cuts into our time and then...